Have you ever wondered how, how these top listing agents make it look so easy? I mean, when I was when I was brand new, I remember that I got my first listing after eight months. And even at that point, it felt like I was working. I would work so hard just to get to a possible yes, not to mention a yes. I mean, getting a yes on a listing at that point was like, oh, what was that feeling like? That was that was that was like the most uh, and that's even hard to explain the feeling of your first listing, right? If you remember the feeling of your first listing, put it in the chat. Like, and then, and then your second listing and third listing and fourth listing, um, very similar feeling. It's like you work so hard to get to that point, right? All the no's, all the trying to figure everything out to get to that point. And for someone to go with another agent or maybe, and when you finally get that, yes, I mean, it's like the heavens have rained down. Like it's, it's, it's the cause for celebration. It really is. Well, it, 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 and then you look at these, like I had agents in my office. I started at exit realty, right? That's where I started exit realty in Gulf Shores, Alabama. And I remember there were two agents in my office, the top producers, it was up. Uh, uh, Scott and Jack, and they were knocking down two, three, four, five plus listings a month. It just like cranking them out, cranking them out. And I remember thinking, what in the world are they doing? What are they saying? Like, how are they getting so many listings? Yet here I am, and I'm working. At the time, honestly, at the time, I feel like even looking back, I feel like I was working harder. I was working harder. I was definitely putting in more mental fortitude, more mental energy towards trying to get listings. And they were cranking out listings every week. They were cranking out listings. And I remember thinking, what in the world is going on? And, and, and from that point on, I went on a mission and I was going to crack the code. I was going to I was going to understand why they were cranking out listing after listing after listing, and I was cranking out zero listings. And honestly, it took me a couple decades. <laughs> I mean, it took me a good decade to get a handle on it and to start cranking out listings, but it took me a couple decades to really understand the principles behind it and what it really takes and how, how the game really works, because that's what this is. If you if you if you really think about what the top listing agents do, because they get so many listings, it's more of a game, right? It's more of a listing game. It's not even about money at that point because they're making so much money. They can't even spend all the money that they're making, right? When you when you when you develop the skills and you understand the principles, right? And you and you you know you when you when you when you recognize that there are rules to the game and you and you learn the rules of the game. And and you play by the rules of the game, then th you start knocking down listings the same as all these other top listing agents. So that's what I want to share with you today. I want to share with you what took me two decades to really wrap my head around when it comes to, um, I'll just put it like this, becoming the person who people are dying to list their property with, right? Becoming the person who people say yes to before you even go to the listing appointment, before you even ask for the business, before you even sit down at the table to go over the comps and the listing agreement, et cetera, et cetera. And your listing presentation, if in fact you do one, which is a whole other conversation because I did about two listing presentations, like a formal sit down PowerPoint at the, at the counter uh, with clients. And I never did it ever again. <laughs> I did two and I never did one ever again. Not to say that it's wrong because it's not. I know people that crush it and I've seen their listing presentation. I'm like, that is really good. Like, that is amazing. I would list my property with you. And so there's a million different ways to do it. Anybody that tells you that this is the way to do it, be real careful about whatever they're trying to push on you or sell you, et cetera. Um, there's a million different ways 
uh, to do it. There's a million different ways to lead gym. There's a million different ways to win listing appointments. There's a million different ways to sell your listings and market your listings and do social media and all the different things that we do as agents. There's not one right way for any given agent. Right. There's a million different ways. You got to figure out which way works best for you the way that I did and the way that you probably have. And if you haven't by now, that's what your mission is to to learn what your lead gen of choice is that works best for you to create the amount of conversations needed to build the size business that you want. Um, the best way to convert listing appointments, the best way to market your listing is to market yourself and build your personal brand and nurture your relationships. There's a million different ways to do all of these things. And so the objective is in the beginning of your career to figure out what exactly works best for you. So I want to talk about, I want to, I want to share this with you. And I also want to talk about what you should be thinking about and doing before, during, and after the listing appointments to ensure that you never lose another listing again, right? Comment yes in the chat if you're ready for this. Hmm. I'm double fisting. I got, I got, I got Coke Zero and Fresca. But don't be fooled. I got me a gallon right here. Like I'm drinking me a nice, a nice solid gallon of water every day. Every day I drink a gallon of water. Okay. So, so before I dive into the before, during, and after, I want to go back a little bit to Little Ricky because. I, I believe that this story here is going to really help you if you really listen to what I'm saying and you execute on what I did when I lost listings when I was a newer agent, because this really helps me. Not, not just helps me get over the fact that I lost the listings, but helps me understand how to play the game, what the rules of the game were, and and it put me... it. When I did what I'm fixing to tell you that I did, and I surely hope that you do as well, it, it fast forwarded my career by years when I did this. Okay, so early on, um, I was just blasting. I was blasting like um, postcards and letters and phone calls and emails. I was just ba 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 ba. I mean, I was a wild man, if you guys can imagine me back then. Um, and and I would get calls and I would talk to property owners and, 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 and I was just a new agent. I was just saying what I thought needed to be said. And my focus really was listing. Like it really was um, focused around trying to get listings. It, it wasn't really focused around trying to help people because I didn't understand that entire dynamic yet. I was just trying to build a career. I just, I, honestly, I was trying to make a paycheck. I was roofing houses and the money that I was making roofing houses was very little. And I was doing all I could do to make a paycheck because 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 you see the size of the paycheck, right? The size of the paycheck is like I remember my first commission check was like six grand or something, which was like crazy. And, and then and then I closed on two deals on the same day and it was like five grand. It was my, my grandmother's condo. I made five grand on it. And then I closed on another condo for six grand. So I made like $11,000 my first day I ever got paid in real estate. And it, I, like, I never had $11,000 before. It was, it was, um, oh, I can't even tell you the feeling. And so up to that point, I had talked to so many property owners to get to the point where this person would list with me. Okay. And a year and a half later, I looked back at that eight months and I said, and, and like, because after a year and a half, I went through about seven months of, of listings and sales. Cause I started selling two a month, two a month, two a month. And after about a year and a half, I looked back at those eight months, that eight month period that I didn't sell anything. And I, I recognized moments during those, during that eight months of conversations with property owners where the property owner was literally telling me they wanted to list their property and like they were even telling me that they wanted to list their property with me, but I didn't understand. They weren't telling me that directly. It was an it was indirect. And if you if you understand, most property owners don't really speak directly to you, right? They kind of speak in circles. They talk around certain things and they tiptoe and 
sometimes they're they're direct, but not really. And and when time goes on, as time goes on, you you realize this, and you start to learn how to read between the lines. You also learn that they don't really mean what they say. <laughs> like if they say they're gonna, they're they're only gonna take this much. Like I'm only gonna take. I'm not I'm not gonna go below three hundred. And next thing you know, we're under contract for two ninety. Happens all the time. Same thing with buyers. I'm not going to pay more than three hundred, and we're under contract for three twenty five all the time. And so you start to not only read between the lines, but you, you once you're in so many of those scenarios where people do what do different, and it's not like they're lying to you. Like they knew that they might take lower than three hundred, or they they maybe they didn't, but they're just playing the again the game. This is a game. This is a game for the sellers to negotiate as much as they can. This is a game for the buyers to buy it for as cheap as they can. This is a game for the listing agents to list as many as they can. And so you just have to understand the rules of the game. So, so okay. So after I started listing properties, once I started listing properties and I was in real estate full time, okay, because when I closed my first, those first deals, I kept roofing for another 30 days because I didn't have anything else really under contract. And so maybe I had a listing, but it wasn't pending or anything. So I was like, ah, oh, I don't have another paycheck coming. So I'm going to keep roofing. And so I and so I kept roofing for 30 days. And during that 30 days, I put two more in, under contract. When I put those two under contract and I picked up another listing, I said, okay, I'm going to go full time. And so when I went full time, now I'm in the office eight hours a day. Okay, now I'm going gangbusters. And so... I'm in the office every day and I'm going crazy. I'm talking to so many property owners because I'm cold calling, baby. I'm cold calling. I'm calling every single person. And, and so I would talk to property owners and I would have listing appointments and I would go see golf front condos and I would go meet property owners and, and I would go through all these, these, I would go through the motions of what agents do to get listings. And I remember specifically several situations where I had a great relationship built with the property owner and we've been talking for months, okay, months. And then I would see it pop up on MLS with another agent. This happened numerous times. I would see it pop up and, and you, you know the feeling. So as soon as I see it pop up, I'm like, like I felt like completely rejected. I felt completely just like, how could this happen? Why would this person do this to me? Like, why would they lead me on like this? Why would they act like they're my buddy and then act like they're going to list with me and then list with somebody else? I didn't understand. So this is what I did. And this is what I want you to do. What I started to do now, I don't even know if I, I don't even know if I started to do. I think I did this the first time it happened, and I remember the property. Like I remember the property, eight hundred one Royal Palms. The agent that listed it was Steve Warren, and the property owner's name was Blackman. I don't I, maybe day. I don't remember his first name. It was Blackman, um, and this was back in two thousand three. I remember this vividly. And, and so this is what I want you to do. Cause this is what I did. I called the agent, Steve. And I said, and I said, Steve, I see you just listed Royal Palms 801. Congrats on that. And I said, you know, I've been talking to that owner for about three or four months and I had a really good relationship built with him. I'm just, I'm just wondering like how you got the listing because I think new agents, have this thought that every listing happens like they met the agent the day they got the listing, right? That's what I, th I think that's what a lot of new agents think that they, they're, they're oblivious to this whole nurturing relationship for years up to the point that they decide they want to do something. They call you. I think new agents are oblivious to that because they don't have any of that. So they, 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 they assume that most property owners, when they want to list, they just call a random agent or interview three agents they know nothing about and figure out who's the best and they pick one. It's not how it works. So, so with Steve, he's like, Oh, I sold it to him pre sale. I sold it to him pre sale when he bought it before the building was built. I represented him when he bought that condo 
as it was being built. And I said, oh, okay. And it all made sense to me. And I didn't call the client in that scenario. I may have emailed him and said, congratulations or whatever. Good luck. If you need something, let me know. I'll try to sell it, stuff like that. I might have, but I don't remember because that part wasn't important. What was important to me was to understand that it was not my fault. It was not my fault that they listed the property with a different agent. They already had this relationship in place. And this is why another reason why in my scripts, I always ask, you know, is there an agent in the area you would work with if you were to do something? Um, because I want to know where I stand. I want to know where I stand long term with this prospect. If there's an opportunity to plant a stronger seed now, or am I a backup plan for now? I want to know. That's a side note. So, so later on, this happened a few more times. And guess what I did? I not only called the agent, but I called the client. And I called the client. And I'm like, congratulations. Like, I see you listed the property. Like, I'm happy for you. Now, I just want to ask you, because like I'm trying to do everything I can do at this point in my career to get better at being an agent so I can serve people in the highest level possible. I just want to ask you how you picked the agent because I felt like we had a great relationship, right? And I'm not mad that you didn't pick me. I just want to understand the methodology, the mindset behind you picking another agent. And, and I'll, I'll give you some of the responses. Like I remember one of the responses was that th I was talking to the husband. Well, the wife had their favorite. They had a, they had a best friend or whatever, an agent. So they, they went with that agent. Um, Others were, we had this relationship, just like the first one. And so what I, what I, the pattern that started to happen with these, with these listings that I lost, quote unquote, the pattern was that there was already an agent in the mix that had a much stronger uh, foothold on the relationship with that client than I did. And so, and so I started to understand See, because I because during that time I was also getting listings, right? I was getting listings, but then I was also losing listings. But I wanted to understand why, so that I could number a feel feel understand that it wasn't my fault. That's the first thing I needed to know. It wasn't my fault. Like, did I do something wrong? Like, what 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 did I do wrong? I want I need to know so that I could be better. And what I found that was my goal when I called the agents and and the clients after they listed. That was my goal to find out what I did wrong because I wanted to correct what I did wrong. But what happened was amazing, was amazing. I What I actually found out was that it wasn't my fault. And, and the clients were even telling me like, you are great. Like if it wasn't for the relationship we have with this agent, you would be our guy. And so it boosted my confidence. So what most agents do is they take a listing that they lose and they just cry about it and they just, that's it. And they just go on to you know, trying to do whatever. And they take that negative experience with them as baggage to their next appointment. And what I'm telling you that you should do is that when you lose a listing, find out from the client and the agent why. Because what you're going to find is going to boost your confidence to the moon. You're going to realize that it's not your fault. Most of the time, 90% of the time, I'm not saying it's never going to be your fault. Okay. There might be some things that you did do, but 90% of the time, it's not going to be your fault like you think it is. And you're going to understand exactly what happened. So understanding what happened gives you the power and knowledge to understand who you need to be to get all the future listings. So what did that teach me? It taught me I need to have relationships with the most people in the market so that I'm the guy that they call when this new agent comes along and has a four-month relationship with them. It doesn't matter that they started the four-month relationship and they hadn't talked to me in years. They're still going to call me. That's what I realized. And so I started to understand the game. And it's so powerful. So that's the first thing I want you to get out of this video is, is to un when you lose a listing, don't assume what happened. Find out for sure what happened. Congratulate everybody involved. Take that knowledge with you and that new wisdom and go make go get five more deals. I always talk about losing deals gives you future time back. Um, 
is and I have this 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 rule of five where you lose a listing, you set a timer for five minutes, you sulk about it for five minutes, right? And then you never think about it ever again. And you take the time that you want to spend on that listing, right? Because like like getting the listing, signing the listing, um, setting up pictures, doing all the setting up showings for other agents, you know, negotiations, maybe you have to drive there, inspections, you know, all the process of getting to the closing from contract to close. We talk about hours that you just got back and time is our most valuable resource. So not only can you take that experience and learn from it and learn the rules of the game, you can also you also get future time back that you can take and go create five more deals in the same time that it took you to close that one deal and thus multiply your business through losing deals. I'm going to take a sip of Coke Zero on that one. Mm. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. So um, I, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the the before, during, and after, and then after that. I'm going to give you a few more tips before we get out of here, okay? So let's get up on the, the trusty vibe board. Let's make the vibe happen. We love the vibe. Got to have the vibe. All right. Badal. Yes, sir. Let's make sure it is doing what it needs to do. It is doing what it needs to do. Okay, I love this. Okay, so when I think about these, right, I bring it back to biblical terms, right, with the formula in the Bible of be, do, have, okay? And basically what, what that formula means is, is that you've got to become the person who can do the thing so that we can have the things that we want. Most people, they want to have everything in the world, right? But they're not, most people aren't really willing to do the things that you need to do in order to have those things, or they're not willing to learn how to do the things, AKA becoming the person who knows how to and can do the things to have what they want. So most people, they, they, they want things, but they're not willing to do, or maybe they do, but they're not willing to learn. See, what, mo what happens most with most people, okay, I, I see this time and time and time again, and it was even the same with me, the same with me. I learned a few things, and I thought, that's going to get me to the mountaintop. And so then what did I do? I went and I did the thing that I learned how to do, but I didn't try to learn anything else new. I just continued to do what I learned over and over and over again. And I felt like that was going to get me to the mountaintop and I could have the things that I wanted to have. But what we fail to realize is that this process doesn't stop with just one thing that you learn or two things that you learn or three things you learn. You have to continue learning new things. Continue, right? That, that's the key word. Write that down continue learning new things because when you learn something new and then you do that thing and you have success, you're going to hit a plateau, right? You could learn, you could, you could learn new things. If you live to be a thousand, 10,000 years old, you could continue to learn new things every day and do different things to have more things. It's endless. And so why would we think that we could just learn one or two things and then that's going to get us where we want to go? No, that's, that's why the, the, that that's why everything exists the way that it does because of the process that we have to go through and that's why most people aren't successful because they stop learning new things they learn something and they think oh that's going to get me where I want to be and when they visualize their future they visualize themselves not too different from where they are right now which is completely false so when we think about becoming the person we want to become the person who sellers Say yes to beforehand, right? Before they even sit down and meet with you, before you even sit down at the coffee table to talk about the listing. So in the book, Full Fee Agent um, by Steve Scholl and Chris Voss, um, there's, a, there's an idea, the favorite and the fool. Right. And, 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 and this is so interesting. When I when I read this book, I literally realized why. I literally at, towards the end of my career, 
I knocked down my my listing conversion rate was so high and I just chalked it up to I was really good. <laughs> I thought I was just like the greatest. I didn't do a listing appointment. Right. I mean, I didn't do a listing presentation or anything. I just thought I was just so great. That's why I was getting all the listings. But that really wasn't the case. The, the, the actual case was that I had become the favorite. And what the and what this what this means is what the favorite and the fool means is, is that the seller has already established a relationship with an agent in some form or fashion, and they are their favorite. Most people know several agents. Okay, but they've got a favorite in mind. And normally they decide to sell a house. They've got their favorite in mind. And so and so the book says that there's an 80% chance that the seller is going to go with that favorite. Okay. But then they go ahead and call two more uh agents to interview three total. <laughs> Let's see where you at. Bam. Uh, Bam. And so, and so they, they go ahead and, and, and they go ahead and call two more agents because they just want to make sure that their favorite is actually their favorite. And so the book gives these two agents a 20% chance. So there's still a chance that one of these agents are going to get the listing. There's a chance, but there's a much greater chance and you have to have far less, uh, you know, a, a high, you, you have to have you, you don't have to have as high a skill level. See, if you're in this boat with 20 percent, you got to have a higher skill level to win the listing over the over the favorite who has an 80 percent chance. So the question is, how do we become the favorite in most scenarios? <clears throat> and you also want to identify if you're the favorite or the fool, because the the fools actually. And like, this is their terminology. I wouldn't actually use the word fool, but this was their terminology, favorite in the fool. The fool, they, they, the seller calls them, says, hey, I want to sell. They go through all their things. And, and these two agents here, they actually feel like they have a really great chance. Maybe they think they have an 80% chance when actually they only have a 20% chance. It's because another part of this is is through the process is understanding and asking the right questions to understand if you're the favorite or if you're not the favorite right and then and then you know how to kind of deal with that scenario okay so when we think about before during and after right the listing appointment right, to ensure that we never lose another listing again. Right, I'm going to make three key points for each of these moments before, during, and after to help you understand and visualize the things that you can do to ensure that you're the favorite, right? To ensure that you're the favorite. And then at the end, I'm going to give you a couple extra tips that I'm going to throw in there. Okay. So, so the first thing, okay, the first thing is actually, we're just going to talk about it, becoming the person, right? The people say yes to, okay? So, so, so this is an exercise <clears throat> that we can do. When we think about becoming an agent that people say yes to, actually think about that for a second. OK, and what I want you to do is I want you to sit down and I want you to write a list of the characteristics of an agent that people would say yes to. Like what kind of agent would you say yes to? OK, so so I thought of a couple. I wrote a couple down. Uh, dependable. Right. If, if, I, if I see that an agent is dependable, OK, then that's a characteristic that I want in my agent that I'm going to say yes to knowledgeable right understands the market confident i want to see some confidence in my agent hard working right and so you, so you start writing down all the characteristics of uh, uh, of an agent that people would say yes to professional um caring consistent Uh, honest, right? And we could we can sit here and go all day long and probably come up with all kinds of different characteristics of an agent 
that people would say yes to. So th this is something that you do before, right? And it takes time to develop this, but you, you got to understand this part right here is becoming this person right here before you're actually going to become people's favorite agent going into the listing appointment. You know how like new agents come in and they go to a listing appointment, they're, they're getting interviewed by three agents and they lose the listing and they think it was a listing presentation or they think that they said something wrong, right? And, 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 and in reality, the other agent who was the favorite They've shown the prospect over years, a lot of times, how dependable they are, how knowledgeable they are, how confident, how hardworking, professional, caring, consistent, and honest they are. So if you're not these things that people say or would say yes to, then, then that's where we got to start. <laughs> so being dependable, right? Let's just talk about each one for a second. I'll give you a few little tips here. Being dependable, what does that mean? Well, it starts with being dependable to yourself. Most agents, and I'm just saying most agents, this is true, most agents, they'll tell themselves they're going to make a call session at 9 o'clock the next day, and then they don't. That's not being dependable. You're not even dependable to yourself. So you, don't, you, you slowly begin to not trust yourself, so you start, there's no way you can instill trust in other people for you because you don't even trust yourself and you don't even know. So when you talk to your prospects, this is messing with your communication to your prospects. You can't put your finger on why these people aren't, you know, that you, that there's something you can't put your finger on. And I can tell you what it is. You're not being dependable to yourself. And it all starts with you. Like, I'm going to get up at a certain time. I'm going to go to the gym. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Okay, now do it every single time. And when you do it every single time, you'll, you'll, You'll develop this belief in yourself that you know that you'll be there for your clients every single time that they need something. Because if you don't prove it to yourself that you're dependable, then you're not going to be able to prove it to other people that you're dependable. You might be able to fake it a little bit, but you're not, you're not going to be able to completely fake that. Nobody wants to fake it anyway. Be the real thing. Don't be a fake. Be the real thing. Actually be dependable. And if you're not dependable to yourself or others right now at this current time, they're step one to becoming the person that people will say yes to. Knowledgeable of the market, right? Study your MLS. Watch the MLS hot sheet for 15 minutes every day. New listings, pendings, closings, expires, et cetera, right? Scan through there and understand the market. This is, this is a place to start, right? Then through your experiences of showing property, going to listing appointments and putting things under contract and watching the market trends, et cetera, et cetera. And you've just become very knowledgeable about the market and it becomes second nature. Confident, right? If you're dependable to yourself, then you're going to be confident. Because at the end of the day, like you, you know why you're there. You know what your value is. People like wonder, what's my value? My value is, is that I show up every single time. I'm going to do what I said I was going to do. That's my value. And I know I'm going to do that. There's nothing you can do or say that's going to prevent me from doing exactly what I said I was going to do every single time. So therefore, I'm confident and I'm going to speak with confidence when I talk to you. And you're going to know that just by the sound of my voice because I'm a confident person because of the fact that I don't let myself down. Dude, hardworking. Like everybody loves a hard worker. Right. When you see somebody working hard, you uh, you immediately are kind of attracted to them. Right. It's, it's like a it's like a magnetization. Right. Hard workers. Number one, if they're working hard in front of you, they're working hard behind closed doors. Right. If they're consistent, if you see them working hard consistently, I guarantee you they're consistent behind closed doors, which means they're going to win big. And when people see you consistently working hard. They're, they, 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 this is a big piece of it. When they see you working hard, which kind of adds to the consistency. These two kind of work together. Consistent. See, when they see you working hard consistently, now you've really got something. And how can you prove that? How can you prove that you're a hard worker consistently? Social media, right? Social media, consistently posting on social media, showing up on social media, doing your weekly emails, right? Showing up every single day, doing what you said you were going to do. 
following up when you said you were going to follow up every single time the exact same way, which kind of is the definition of professionalism, right? Dressing appropriately, you know, not using profanity, caring about them, right? Being honest every single time. If you don't know the answer, tell me you don't know the answer. These are the pillars right here. And like I said, we could continue on and continue adding to this list if we wanted to, but this is where it starts. Like if you, if you aren't these things, then you've got to become these things so that you can, that's step one of becoming the person that people are going to say yes to before you even ask for the business, before you even show up to the listing appointment. And, and like, it, it wasn't that I was so great at the listing appointment when I towards the end of my career, when I had such a great conversion rate, it's because I had done these, I had been this person for so long and I have proven to thousands of people who I actually was that I was the favorite. I was the favorite going in. I thought it was because I was just such great, so great at the listing appointment. No, I wasn't. I was probably just as good as I was at any listing appointment um, ever in my career, maybe a little better. The second thing that you've got to do before the listing appointment is make contact, right? If we're not talking to people, we're not closing deals. And I don't care how you do it, right? It can be outbound calls, calling for sale boners, expire, circle prospecting, et cetera. Or it can be inbound calls. Like if you can create enough content and you have some kind of machine system in place that just creates conversation after conversation after conversation with the exact people you want to do business with great i don't really care how you do it as long as you understand that if you're not talking to people you're not going to be closing deals and so we've got to make contact with people who may possibly want to sell their property now or later. I mean, you have to do that. You have to talk to them before the listing appointment. Otherwise, there's not going to be a listing appointment. Okay. The third thing is, is we want to identify, identify. We want to ask the right questions. Well, let me, let me, let me erase that. Really, we want to ask the questions and I want to sum it all up like this. Why me, right? I want to understand Am I the favorite? Do I have an 80% chance here or just a 20% chance? Because I was on an Instagram live yesterday and the agent said, I did a listing appointment. They're interviewing two other agents. I haven't heard from them in a week. What do I do? What do I do? And I'm like, okay, well, why are they selling? And I went through my whole thing about why they're selling and you know, all this stuff to try to understand the seller situation and everything. And I'm like, okay, well, have you asked them what their relationships are with the other two agents? No. I'm like, okay, well, I would want to know that. And she's like, well, it really doesn't matter to me because I'm going to go on as many listing appointments as I can. And the more that I go on, the, then the higher, the you know, the, the more that I'll get. I said, yeah, no, no, no. Like that's all fine and dandy. Right. But if you're not the favorite, and like if they if you like if you just ask them straight up and they tell you like I've got you know the person that sold us the house you know my wife really likes them you know I kind of want to interview other agents at least you know what you have got going into it and she said the agent said yesterday that it's draining her mentally like thinking about if she's going to get this listing and I was like if you would ask that question and understand where you stood then then you you could relieve some of that mental that mental capacity of worrying about what's going to happen with this and you kind of know what your percentage is and then you just let the chips fall rather than sitting around worried like like how this thing is going to go down so so w w before the listing appointment i want to understand why they're even calling me? Like, where are they here for me? Like, is this a past client? Is this a referral? Did they get my weekly emails? Did they see me on social media? Like, what what has driven them to me? What, what How long have they been following me? How deep is my relationship with them? Are they interviewing other agents? What's their relationship with the other agents? Because another thing that the book says, um, full fee agent, is that, 
if you're the fool, right, if you're one of the fools, don't even go to listening appointment. Now, I don't necessarily agree with that. I don't agree with everything in the book. The book is amazing. The book talks really highly about relationship uh, building uh, businesses, like love the book. Like it's, it's incredible. And I love to hear different points of view that, that kind of go against the way that I feel, but I love, I love the whole concept and I can use a lot of this. And I love the fact that they say, don't even go if you're the fool, but I disagree. And I don't think, I don't think you, you necessarily maybe not don't want to go to every single one, right? I probably would, if I was an agent, go to every single listing appointment. Why not? Um, right. More practice, but, but at least, you know, where you stand. So I think it's very important. So, so become the person that people say yes to by becoming the person, right? Think about the characteristics of an agent that people would say yes to make contact with as many sellers as possible to put yourself in front of them and make sure you understand where you stand with them when it comes to the, to the depth of your relationship. Okay. So let's get into the during the listing appointment. The very first thing I want to do, and I might do this beforehand. Um, I've done this right on the spot a lot of times. But I go five to ten questions deep on their why. Why are they selling? And when they tell me the answer, that answer is triggering curiosity inside of me that makes me want to ask three more questions. And then, and then, and then those questions and the answers to those questions lead to more questions. And I go five to ten questions deep with my pro with with my potential sellers, my potential clients, because if I don't understand why they're selling. My goal is to understand why they're selling more than they do. I want to ask them questions that they haven't even thought about when it comes to their situation. And what is that going to do? It's going to show them that I care, right? It's going to show them, it's going to show them that, that I'm, I'm knowledgeable about, about understanding the process, right? And, and extracting the data that I need in order to help them, right? It's going to show a level of professionalism, caring, Right, it's going to show them some of the things that I am. I am a few of these characteristics that people say yes to um, before we even get to the point of asking for the business. So the first thing I want to do is I want to understand why to the deepest level. Right. The next thing I want to do is I want to create a custom game plan. Right. Every single listing appointment I went on, I would go five to 10 questions deep. Right. I would look at the property and do all this stuff and, you know, listen to them and all. The, but but my goal is, is to understand why they want to sell more than they do. Take their situation, understand their situation to the fullest and then create a custom game plan. Custom meaning different for each client. Why? Because each client has a different situation, different motivations, different reasons for selling. Some of them don't even care if it sells. That's another thing. A lot of agents, this was another agent on the live yesterday, was worried um, about their listings not selling. And I'm like, and, and she's like, how do I sell these listings? You know, they're overpriced or not getting action. And I'm like, that's not your job. Your job isn't to sell the listing, it's to help the seller do whatever it is they're trying to do, which, by the way, might not be to sell the property. Like, like I don't know what the percentage is. I, I would love to know some statistics on how many sellers actually don't care if their property sells or not. And then we take it as an agent. We're like, we have to sell this. It's like, no, the seller actually doesn't really care if it sells or not. Connect with them, help them, uh, and create a custom game plan based on their situation and what they got going on. This is what I did every single time, right? Five to 10 questions deep, custom game plan. And the third thing is unique value proposition. You've got to have a unique value proposition. So what, what, so one thing you want to do, one thing you want to do is you want to, you want to create a toolbox 
right? And in your toolbox are paragraphs, right? Paragraphs that you've written, you've rewritten, you've edited, you've memorized, right? And one is, let's just say, um, your social media strategy, right? Your second one is like your direct mail strategy. Your third one is your database strategy, right? And you actually sit down and create a very interesting paragraph, you know, three sentences or so, right? Um, Jordan Cohen, he does his... Um, He does his photography. Um, unique value proposition, and what and, and so and so you take these things that all agents do, right? And and but you explain it in a way that makes it sound so different. And you do and you do have something different. Your little spin on how you do it, and you sit down and you create these paragraphs, and then you 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 memorize them and you rewrite them and you tweak them and you get them just right. And then you have this toolbox of these different things, right? Five, six different things, and you're not going to use all of these. every list can point, but you've got them in your toolbox and you can bring them out if you feel like you need them. Okay. So, so it's like every agent, like, you know, most agents do direct mail, do social media, do photography. Every agent does photography. However, you can explain it in a way that's different. Like I show up with the photography, we do it at dust so that the pictures are better. I sit there with the photographer and make sure we get the right angles for social media and for the, the postcards, Like there's things that you can do to make yourself stand out that makes a big, big, big difference. So, so, but let me tell you what my unique value proposition was. Um, cause I, cause I didn't really, I didn't go that deep with it, but I think you guys should. But what I did, like, this is how I, this is how I got them because, cause every time, um, You know, like, you know, all the agents are the same. How do you stand out? What are you going to do differently? And what I, I what, what I always came back to, because most of the sellers I got via the phone, right? And if I didn't get them via the phone, as far as our first contact, at some point I did call them and have a conversation. And they knew that I was a phone call guy, that I was an agent that gets on the phone and really hustles and shakes the trees and shakes the bushes and try to make things happen. So, so when I'm at the listing point, like, what do you, okay, what are you going to do differently? What, you know, what, what are you going to do to sell the property, et cetera, et cetera. My go-to was that I would call like, I'm going to call, All the owners of older slash smaller properties and see if they want to upgrade, right? And so this was my thing right here. And so I'm like, I'm like, if you, if you, you know, as soon as you move forward, I'm, I can go back to the office right now. I'm going back to the office to make calls right now, right? I had a list I was about to call, but I can switch right over to calling about your property if you're ready to move forward. And so this was my unique value proposition that I was willing to go right back to the office and call, call owners that have smaller or older homes and see if they wanted a nicer one, wanted a bigger one, um, wanted a newer place and I was calling about that listing. And it was so interesting because when I did that, I would go back and I would make calls and I did sell some properties that I did sell the listings that way. It happened. Um and sometimes it happened because the person knew somebody, right? Knew somebody that wanted the property. But what was even far greater was was I would go back and I would make 200 calls. I I call I talk to tw 20 people um and I'd get 10 new future clients. And when you start compounding these efforts and you get 10 10 10 10 10 10, right? All the time, every week, every day, it adds up to thousands of people and then these people do bit do multiple deals with you and then they refer people to do multiple deals with you. And so you literally took this listing that may not even sell 
You use the fact that you're going to call people to, to win the seller over, that that was your unique value proposition. And then you, and then you use that to multiply your business over and over and over and over again, right? Th this was my methodology. This was my unique value proposition that I was going to do anyway. So that's the thing I was going to do that. I was going to make calls anyway, but, 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 and so your unique value proposition may not be, you may not be a caller. OK, whatever, but come up with what your unique value proposition is that makes you stand. What's your thing? Right. What's your thing? And 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 write it down, rewrite it, tweak it, memorize it and and have your unique value proposition. Your one thing that's really that's your deal that's going to help you win your clients over because it's such an amazing thing that that really no other agents do. Right. Um. And then you've got your you've got your toolbox of all the things that all the agents do right here. You've got you've got your toolbox of the things that all agents do. You just explain it differently. And then you've got your unique value proposition that you throw in there. And you may not use that unique value proposition. They may be like, I'm ready to sign. You just sign it. Right. You, you, you may talk about photography, but you may not use any of these other things. Right. Or you may use all of them. Who knows? It depends on the listing appointment and what's going on. All right, let me know in the comments. You guys are getting this, enjoying this, and this is helping you understand the process of how to never lose another listing again. Okay, so afterwards, after the listing appointment, right, you've got to have your process. You've got to have your... your process and your systems in order, okay? So I'll so I'll break that down for you. Let me go over here. So Okay. So so I had a process Okay, I had a process for um let's call it listing automation right and what i want are listings to take up zero time of mine okay okay so so think about think about the listing automation process okay the listing automation process so i would get a listing when the seller said, yes, if I didn't get the listing signed right then or if they're out of town, I have to docu-sign the listing. Maybe they thought about it and called me and said, okay, I'm ready, whatever. If they say yes at the kitchen table, I'm going to get it signed right then and there. And then I'll just hand it to my assistant. But if we're doing this electronically, I'm going to text my assistant, right? And I'm going to text them the seller's name, sell, email, the property, right? The price and the commission, right? And, I, and at the top of the text, I would just say new listing. And I would send this information and then she would take it from there. What did she do? She took that information. She um, sent the contract to sign. She wrote and sent the contract. She ordered pictures. She put a partial in MLS got the pictures back, put it in MLS. Then she started setting up all the showings of any agents that wanted to see it. I didn't hear anything about it until an offer was made. Then I stepped back in to negotiate it. So, so she took this, like the moment I sent this text, I don't hear nothing else about it. All these things happen automatically. And now I can just continue doing what I do, which is what? I'm gonna go right back to the office. Okay, and so here, here was the rest of the process, okay? Uh, on top of the listing automation, right? We would do direct mail, postcard to the subdivision. We would send the email out. Um, what else do we do? Uh, let's see. Oh, listing video. You know, all your stuff, right? Whatever it is. Whatever it is, you get your process in order of every listing, and you create an automated process around it. Okay, 
then and so since since this automation process is in place now what are you going to do you're going to go call your trade up sellers who might want to upgrade into the listing and you can literally go do that that day because you're not worried about any of this stuff it's all automated and now because of that you can literally stack listings to the moon because you have the process and your systems in order Okay, so the second thing you're going to do is make your calls, right? You're going to call those trade-up sellers. You're going to call those trade-up sellers, okay? And then the last thing that I'm going to do as after I get after I get the listing, right? We've said we're going to we got the process, got the systems. I'm calling, got the trade-up sellers, right? And then I'm going to follow up. every two weeks follow up every two weeks right unless i might be communicating with certain sellers that have listings more frequently than every two weeks i may have to talk to them about this that or the other whatever the case may be but i'm going to go through all my listings every two weeks i always did it on friday every two weeks i, I made my friday call session my follow-up uh session and um and so what i did was is every friday every other friday I wanted to know the external and internal data. Okay, now what is that? So the external are all the listings around my listing. So here's my listing, right? And so I want I want to know all the listings around the listing. What's going on with the market around my listing? Right? What's going on around my listing? Right? What's come on the market since we listed? What's went under contract? What's closed? How does it compare to my listing? That's the external data. So I'm going to keep a close eye on that. So every Friday when I call my sellers, I would study the external data of the market in MLS to see if there's any changes or even, and if there's not changes, that's data. That means everything else is sitting on the market too. So I want to share that with my seller. They don't have time to research the market. This is just another value proposition that we offer as agents that people don't talk about. Okay. The internal data is everything within the listing, right? The buyer's feedback, right? How many times is it being shown? What's the feedback, right? How long has it been on the market, right? All those things, all that internal data of the listing, I want to understand it. And maybe I'm calling a couple of these agents that have listings to understand what did it go? What, what, you know, did you get close to asking price? Have you had any showings, right? And I'm collecting extra internal data, external data. And over here, I may call some of the agents that show the property, based on the feedback to get additional internal data before I make that call on Friday to make sure my seller has everything that they need to make a decision if they want to make a change in the listing price or even if they want to take it off the market or whatever it is that they want to do, um, they have that, that option, right? So um, so that's that's it. Let me, let me go back and I'm going to give you guys a couple more tips and then we'll get right up out of here. So before, during, and after the listing, the listing appointment, we want to become the person. If you're not the person yet, <laughs> that's step one. Become the person, right? Make contact with sellers. Understand why you. Five to ten questions deep at the appointment or maybe before. Custom game plan based on that. What's your unique value proposition? Create your processes and systems. Make your calls, right? Or however you're going to market the property and follow up with the sellers every two weeks. Woo! <laughs> My goodness gracious. All right. So let me get, give you guys a couple extra tips before we get out of here. Um, the uh, Let's see. Oh, yeah. So, so one thing is, is a lot of agents blame not getting listings on their listing presentation, et cetera. I never did a listing presentation. I did it twice. Um, so... As I said in the beginning of the video, go out and call the sellers, call the agents who got the listings or gave that listing to another agent and understand why. When you understand why, it's going to help you. It's going to help you so much build your confidence in knowing that it wasn't your fault. Okay. It's going to help you so much. Instead of stewing about it and wondering why me and why not me and all this stuff, 
you'll realize it had nothing to do with you and that they're going to probably tell you you were great and now you can be super confident moving forward. I never price a property without seeing the property, right? Some agents want to really quickly be like, I'm going to send you some numbers. I'm going to send you a CMA. Don't do that. Make sure you see the property in person before you price the property. You can get into a lot of trouble like that because CMAs are computer generated and it could be way high, way low. You could get the seller's hopes up that it's really high when it's really a dump or it could, it could come in too low and they say, now nah, let's not even move forward. We'll just wait for the market to come up when the whole time the market was higher than what the CMA said. Always go look at the property uh, before. Now, there's always exceptions to the rule. Like for some reason you can't get in or there's a renter or the seller's adamant, blah, blah, blah. Sure. Do what you do what you got to do. But as a rule, look at the property before you price it. Um, do your best. Do your best to get a price from the seller first, right? Get them to give you what they want. Try to get that number before you give them a number. Um, and again, it doesn't happen every time, okay? But you do the best you can do. That's what you want to aim for. And then use the comps to justify the number, right? Uh, I, comps played about 10% into me, me pricing properties, because 90% of it was what does the seller want? And one thing I always did, as soon as a seller told me that they wanted to sell, the first thing I would do, right, after the initial call and, you know, uh, we talked about why they want to sell and why me and all this stuff. The first thing I would do when I got off the phone and got back to my computer or whatever is I would look in the county records and see when they bought it and how much they paid. I need that information now because when I have that information – um, it kind of tells me where they are because I know, like, let's say they bought it in 2019, right? Now we're in 2024. I know where the general market has went since then. And it kind of gives me an idea right then and there. It also kind of tells me, cause most people want to draw a profit. Like if they bought it in 2000, if they bought it last year, right? I know prices are pretty similar to last year, pretty close, right? Maybe up a little bit, like, um, you know, depending on what month they bought it in last year, et cetera. Like I know we're pretty much even. So chances are if they bought it for retail, if they didn't get it for wholesale and they got it for retail, then they would have to, uh, they're probably going to lose money on it because once they pay closing costs, they're, they're probably going to lose money. So then it comes back to, why are you going to sell this property after you bought it for a year if you bought it for retail? Because the prices are only up like 1%. And so you're going to lose money when you sell this. Why don't you just rent it? Or, you know, you, you start, see, when you understand when they bought it and how much they paid, you really kind of get inside the situation a little better. And you kind of know going into the listing appointment, what you're dealing with. Right. So anyway, I hope this helps. Um, this is how to never lose another listing again, three-step process before, during, and after. Um, my next listing good challenge is Monday. I'll put a link in the description or go to setmorelistingappointments.com. And I'll see you guys on the next video. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you guys very soon. All right. Let me get you guys back up. You guys got any questions? Ricky, I had a question. Mm-hmm.